Evolutionists like to claim that creationists have no peer-reviewed science to back them up. At first, this would seem to be true, but the more you look into it, the more you'll notice how creationists are shut out of academia. Several creationists have either lost tenure or simply been fired just for their belief in creationism. Robert Gentry, Carolyn Crocker, and Richard Sternberg have all had their scientific careers ruined by the evolutionist conspiracy to keep God out of the classroom. Finally, we get to see the true faces of these supposed scientists. I just had to investigate. Creationist scientists have had a very hard time maintaining their positions within the scientific community. For example, Robert Gentry had been working for the Oak Ridge National Laboratory since 1969, but was abruptly terminated when his work on polonium halos began to indicate a young Earth and his testimony at the McLean vs. Arkansas trial in 1981 began to destroy the old Earth hypothesis. Carolyn Crocker had a sterling academic career until she was abruptly fired for simply mentioning intelligent design in her cell biology class at George Mason University. She found herself blacklisted. Since 2001, Richard Sternberg had been an editor for the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington. In 2004, when he dared to allow a pro-intelligent design paper by notable creationist Stephen C. Meyer end up being published, he was abruptly terminated, even though he has publicly stated that he is not personally a proponent of intelligent design. All three of these scientists have gone public with their stories, but surprisingly, they've been unable to bring cases against their former employers. In 1969, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory invited Robert Gentry to use their facilities in an unpaid position. One year previous to this invitation, he had already begun publishing about his views on polonium halos. Although his work was snubbed by the scientific community, the hope at the Oak Ridge Laboratory was that his research would lead to the discovery of super-heavy elements. In 1981, the state of Arkansas passed Act 590, which mandated that creation science be given given equal time in public schools with evolution. That same year, a group of parents brought a lawsuit against the state arguing the unscientific nature of creationism as well as protecting the separation of church and state guaranteed by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Gentry accepted an invitation to testify in favor of Act 590 in the matter of McLean v. Arkansas. In January of 1982, Judge William Ray Overton ruled that for multiple reasons, creationism does not qualify as science. Accounts differ on whether Gentry's relationship with the lab was terminated before before or after the verdict, but three things are clear. First, Gentry was not fired as he was never employed by the lab. Two, he never lost any money as he was never in a paid position to begin with. And three, he obviously wasn't disproving the old earth hypothesis as his side of the lawsuit lost. Meanwhile, according to several complaints from her students, Caroline Crocker did not merely mention creationism. She lectured on it at great length in her temporary position as a guest lecturer on cell biology at George Mason University. University. The disciplinary action received was a warning to cease the lectures. When her appointment was over, the university chose not to renew her contract, but she certainly wasn't blacklisted as she immediately continued lecturing at Northern Virginia Community College, where she received similar complaints and warnings as she continued to lecture on intelligent design. In 2006, she began a year appointment at the Uniformed Services University as a postdoc, where she researched and taught molecular biology techniques. From there, she became the executive director of the Intelligent Design and Evolution Awareness Center and began charging as much as $5,000 to lecture at churches and intelligent design events. For someone supposedly blacklisted, she seems to be doing quite well for herself. In 2001, the peer-reviewed journal The Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington offered an unpaid editor position to Richard Sternberg. Near the end of 2003, he offered his resignation and agreed to continue as occasional editor for some issues over the next year. In August 2004, a few months before before his final year was to end, Sternberg allowed a friend of his, Stephen C. Meyer, to submit a paper entitled The Origin of Biological Information and the Higher Taxonomic Categories. In summary, Meyer's article argues that no natural explanation can account for the information necessary for novel life forms and offers intelligent design as the most reasonable alternative. After admittedly being one of the four individuals involved in the peer review process, it was a blatant conflict of interest for Sternberg to publish the
to paper. As even the most poorly informed scientist can identify a god of the gaps fallacy, the paper was immediately challenged and found not to adhere to the scientific standards of the journal. Sternberg and Meyer, having cited the veil of peer review, have refused to reveal the identities of the other three peer reviewers, but assured the paper that they were all reputable scientists. The journal issued a retraction and informed Sternberg that his free editorial services were no longer necessary. He continued working at his job as a staff scientist at the National Center for Biotechnology Information for years afterward. His credibility is certainly questionable, but his career seems to have suffered no negative effects. Giving all three of these creationists the benefit of the doubt, it is still impossible to look past the exaggerated claims they made about their experiences. None of them were fired. None of them were blacklisted. None of them lost tenure, and none of them told the truth about their experiences. Unfortunately for them, their motivations for manufacturing their versions of events is obvious. But sensationalizing their stories is no better than what actual scientific frauds do. The difference is, when even an evolutionary scientist is exposed as a fraud, always by other evolutionary scientists, their careers are actually destroyed. These three scientists should count their blessings. This is another example of how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.